Okay, welcome um, on this rainy day. I assume you guys are having more rain up there. We're having moderate rain down here in Berkeley. So uh, hopefully nobody's uh, in danger of flooding in your <coughs> house or studio like I had this last big storm. Not this weekend, luckily, but the last one we had. Anyway, we're, we're covering a topic that is really, I think, probably for many people, if not everyone in this class, one of, if not the most interesting topics we're covering this whole semester is Impressionism. And I can tell you for sure that at least one of the Impressionist painting slides that we're going to see today or on Wednesday will be on either the slide essay part of the final or possibly both the slide ID section, because it's such an important, of course, very influential movement, not to mention popular. Um, okay, so there's an exhibit, by the way, at the uh, De Young Museum in Golden Gate Park that includes some Impressionist image. It's not about Impressionist, but it's, it's, it's about pastel color themes in painting over the last 500 years. And it includes some non-Western art, much more recent, uh, early or recently completed modern, I guess you could call pieces. I don't think it includes abstract painting, but uh, it's, it's an interesting exhibit. I've heard about it from other students and read the reviews of it. So that's an extra credit option. Remember, let's uh, do the speaker view here. And then um, I have just a couple of quick announcements, not too many before we get to our first slide. There we go. Um, <clears throat> first of all, your second papers are due one week from today. Now, I can't remember, I think it was somebody somewhere in the uh, past two weeks or so, I think it's been that long, said something about their copy of, maybe it wasn't <laughs> that that uh, uh, direct, but I, I think somebody was on one of, the, of, of your fellow students, that person's here tonight, I'm just reconfirming what I said when that question came up. Uh, the previous time I mentioned the due date uh, is Monday, November 8th. There is no class. There are no classes at the JC. Actually, I don't think anywhere in California on the 10th, it's a federal holiday, uh, or at least it is in this district, um, a holiday. So there, um, I think it's a teach prep, teacher prep day. And then the 11th, I guess, would be the, of course, uh, Veterans Day, I think it's called. Uh, so at this point, uh, we won't meet at all a week from Wednesday. We're definitely meeting the next, you know, today on Wednesday of this week to finish Impressionism, then do post-impression, another really interesting subject, because that's what Van Gogh and Gauguin were. They weren't, in, well, they both dabbled in Impressionism, actually Gauguin more than Van Gogh, but they moved on to their own styles. We're going to talk about them next week, but we're not meeting on Wednesday, a week from Wednesday. Um, the uh, 10th. So the papers are due by midnight on Monday the 8th. That's one week for today. Does anybody have any, I, I think I said this before, but just as a clarification, the requirements are exactly the same as it says in the syllabus, as you can see. The length is the same. The, uh, you know, uh, requirements for each section, you know, one full page minimum on each or more of the meaning and keep them labeled se and separately, right? Um, and then uh, all nine elements, if you want an A. Of course, you need to give examples, two or more of each of the nine elements you discuss in your papers, plus bibliography, endnotes, or, or footnotes in the text within the body of the paper, as usual. So the requirements are exactly the same. I will send you a cover sheet. Um, I'll do that before the weekend, um, at the latest by Friday, uh, which will say paper number two, critique sheet. And uh, just like you did before, you need to attach it to your papers and include it if possible in the same file, PDF file that you send to me. And of course that needs to go, I'll be saying this uh, two more times in case it's not obvious to, um, this would be paper number two, right? And of course we're at 1.2, you guys can, you know, do the minor adjustments. I, I didn't want to write through several different versions of the same instructions. It's the same as before. It needs to go to my AOL, right? Uh, and it would go for obviously would say 1.2, short paper, number two, underline last name, first name. If your name is different on the, I've said this several times and it's caused some confusion and problems. So I'm trying to uh, troubleshoot ahead of time and avoid that happening on your second papers. 
a handful of students sent their papers in, their first papers, under a different name than they were registered. Maybe totally different because it's someone else's email address. So that, that causes mass confusion. But if you do label them correctly, then, then I'll be able to figure out, obviously, fairly easily or reasonably quickly which class you're in and uh, also uh, you know, grade your paper with the others that were turned in on time. So you get yours back at the same time as those that were turned in on time. Okay. Uh, so yeah, we just were, um, if you just joined us, we were just talking about the papers being due one week from today. Same requirements, exactly. Okay. So are there any questions? Remember the topic can be whatever you want. I, I sent everyone tips for writing about architecture. And at this point, I would uh, welcome, we're just finishing up talking about the papers being due one week from today. I, I would say that if you do a paper on architecture, I'm not giving anyone extra help, okay? Meaning that wouldn't be fair, but the instructor gave certain students who do a different type of paper than what else more help, no. But architecture is a little different. So if you have, and, and many of you have confirmed you, you were thinking of doing it, an architecture paper after you got, or before, I think I said it last Thursday or something, the tips for writing about architecture, uh, that should be very helpful. And I will give you, as I would anybody uh, in any class, whatever the subject of art history, whatever topic in the, the realm of art history or, or subject for their papers are on either paper, some personal feedback if you're missing something. So it could be helpful uh, for, for you if you choose to do that. Plus you can make a twofer out of it. If, if you can go to the site of the building, there's so many great works of architecture all over the Bay Area and, and right here or where you guys are, sorry. I'm in the East Bay. You guys can go, you know, Sonoma or Marin County. There's a Marin County Courthouse by Frank Lloyd Wright. There are several Julia Morgans, four of them in within a mile of each other that any one of which would make an interesting topic for a paper uh, in uh, Petaluma, in the old town section of Petaluma. Then there's a Julia Morgan Chapel of the Chimes, it's called, which there's one in Oakland, much more famous and much larger. But the one in Santa Rosa is an interesting, you, can, you don't have to make an appointment during normal business hours. It's open, I think, seven days a week course, because they conduct memorial and funeral services. But probably you would want to go and take pictures during one of those. Anyway, so that could be a you get 10 points extra credit for an architecture site um you know which you give me four photos from color photos with just your name the class and labeling where the what which building it is and what it's on and then that could be the same uh, uh subject for your your papers your second papers so if you haven't already picked a topic give that some thought but whatever you choose to write i've decided to be more open about that you are going to be tested though on on the uh, architecture of uh, early uh, modern. It's called late 19th, early 20th century, the beginnings of what we call modern architecture. Frank Lloyd Wright, Julia Morgan, the first independent woman American architect. And that book, yes, you, you'd need to read what, three chapters in that. And it's if you didn't already get it, you can get it on Amazon for like 22 bucks or something. And it's the only um, architecture book you have to, to even look at, right? And you will be tested, at least there's a good likelihood of one of the slides of her work being on the final under the architecture uh, topic, which is two weeks of lectures as you'll see from the syllabus when we get uh, to that point. That's the last topic for this semester. Okay, any questions about extra credit to your papers, grades or anything before we start the slides, anybody? Uh, so the papers, it's, it's, it's gonna be exactly the same as our first one, except That's just a different painting a different work of art. I, I, I wouldn't limit you to painting. Or, That's if you choose. Or, yeah. yeah, architecture, painting, sculpture, drawing, or photos. Yes, yeah, same requirements. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead then. Uh, I'll stick around as I always do at the end to um, answer any questions you may have. Okay, the first must know is one that I think most of you unless you've been, I hope you have been reading your stocks, Dad. It's at least it is in the edition I last looked at, though they don't give us free free copies, teacher copies anymore. But it should be because it's a very famous and influential uh, painting. Okay, so here we go. This is called The Last of England is the title, just like it sounds. That's, of course, four word title. The Last of England. The um, painter's name is Brown, last name Brown, and the date is 1855. 
Now, this is an example of English realism. So we only have two definitions for, for the uh, whole topic of this in next class on Wednesday. And you'll get them both today. And they're not short definitions. There's just no way to make them short. So here we go. I'm going to say them slowly and repeat them each once. Let's do first one at a time. While we're on the topic, here we are in English realism style painting. What is the definition of that uh, term, English realism? OK, so here it goes. English realism was a movement of painting in, you'd have to say Great Britain, because it wasn't only England, it includes Scotland and Wales and Ireland. So just say Great Britain, a movement of painting in Great Britain uh, from circa 1840 to 1900. You're not going to have to know those dates. No dates that are not on the syllabus you'll be required to remember for the uh, final, but just as part of the, the context. So I'll say it again, the first part of the definition. English realism is a movement of painting in Great Britain from circa 1840 to 1900, comma, in which artists portrayed um, transcripts from real life. That means real, the super realism. If you want to call it photorealism, you could, but that's not part of the definition. Once again, the second uh, part of the definition is in which, you know, this movement in which artists portrayed transcripts from real life, period. Sorry, it's two sentences. And the second part is they did this in order to quote, cure the ills of society, unquote. They actually, it's a quote from their manifesto. Yes, they were an organized movement with membership, meetings, exhibits, you know, it was really formal, right? Um, to become part of that movement, if you chose to, you had to go through, you know, all these steps. So I'll say it again, the second sentence of that definition is that uh, you can say these artists did this in order to quote, cure the ills of society, unquote. Well, that right there would tell you they had a high opinion of their importance, didn't they? Obviously they thought they could cure uh, major social ills or, or problems with painting. But we've seen examples, remember last week with the slave ship uh, of some works of art or the raft of the Medusa that had an impact on uh, even government policies and, and reforms and social justice issues like ending slavery and so forth. So we, we do know that there's a, there was already before 1840, there, there was uh, a, a tradition of some paintings, only a few, uh, but in Western art at least, having a direct influence on society. So that was their goal, was to cure the ills of society. Okay, so how did they try to do that with these realistic style paintings? Will they address topics that they thought needed to have some, you know, social uh, reforms or societal reforms? Not government reforms. They weren't trying to affect the government's policies in Great Britain. They just thought they could reform people's ideas or attitudes. Sounds familiar, right? <laughs> So how did this painting play into that? So here's the, the, the meaning of this painting. Well, this is a couple, it's obvious, and they are heading somewhere away, well, the title tells us, from the shores of England. That is, some of you know this phrase, the White Cliffs of Dover, it's mentioned in a couple of Beatles movies, actually, as the coastline of England, not the whole coastline, but a big part of it right on the English Channel. I mean, they're world famous, they're, they're, they're you know, landmarks of the coastline of part of the coastline of southern England. So they're leaving England. The title tells us that. Anybody want to guess where they might be going? The U.S. Oh, that's a good guess. Yeah, we, the, the artist never said, but that's a good guess. All he said was they're leaving England for the new world. But see, back then, that meant any of the non-European destinations that... Uh, uh, you know, British, or in this case, specifically, they're from England, right, could have gone to. Uh, that could have been Canada, it could have been the United States, it could have been Latin America, it could have been Australia. All we know is, is they're leaving England heading for a life in a new country. That means that they are leaving some things behind. So let's take a look at their faces. I especially want to focus on the, the, the wife and mother. By the way, I didn't, for, for the first two or three years I taught this uh, subject and showed this slide, I didn't even notice. See what the mother's holding? Little tiny baby finger. She's got a baby under her shawl. 
So like a newborn, uh, practically, or very, very young infant. So what, what do you see in her? There's no right or wrong here. Anybody, what, what do you see? Well, the two expressions have some slight differences in what their state of mind is. But what do you think they might be thinking or feel based on what you could see of their expressions? Anybody? Probably wistful and worry on her behalf. Yes, yes, anxiety and worry, definitely, about leaving behind everyone and everything they ever knew. And what maybe a little more so in, in his face, but I even see it in both of theirs. Um, there's another quality. That's definitely one of them. It would have had to be anxiety, of course, as part of it, or, or worry. Uh, yeah, I think you said wistfulness. That, that's a good word. Um, uh, maybe but, commitment. Yeah, dedication or commitment. Yeah, because they've made a decision, they are going to start a new life. Now, some people know this, but if you don't, you should add this to your notes as the context for the meaning of this painting. Why did this artist choose to make this painting and what social ill was he trying to address? Well, we can start with the fact that there was a famine, as some of you know, in Ireland, that's my ancestral heritage, it killed millions of people. It wiped out over half the population. I think some, some say two thirds of the population of Ireland, but there was also poverty and yes, hunger, if not starvation in Scotland and other parts, even some parts of England. So in the British Isles, especially Ireland, but not only Ireland, there was hunger and extreme poverty. And so people were leaving that homeland where they had been born and raised to try and find a better life for their family, for their future. So here's why this art is painted. This is the most important fact about the meaning. When this movement of millions of people every year, an average, well, I don't want to give it away. I was going to ask you guys if anyone knows of how many people from all over the world, first from Europe, but it was early on, it became uh, the immigration. I'm talking about trends of immigrants coming to the United States in our early period and all the way through until the racist laws of the 1920s shut the door for most non-white immigrants. But for that hundred years when there was little, there were some restrictions in certain states, it was really strong ones, but national immigration policy allowed people from all over the world for at least almost most of the hundred years between 1820 and 1920. Literally that's the hundred years in which we have records before there began to pass the restrictive immigration laws. Does anybody have any idea how many people on average each year during that century came to the US from all over the world, anybody? an astounding number maybe millions yeah, close you, <laughs> a million a year on average a million a year it's didn't it's slow world war uh one slowed it down and of course the civil war in, in america but during that century an average meaning a hundred million total in a century so if you just <laughs> the math is pretty easy that's an average of yeah you're you're very close to exactly the right figure there uh, a million a year no other no other country in the world's had that phenomenon none none it, what you know all the consequences that that led to of course uh obviously we're a nation of immigrants that goes without saying but on the other hand you have people who were criticizing this is the last part about the meaning and, and the reason why this painting the painter created to try and address a social ill you might think well what social ill would there be there's just a bunch of individuals choosing to leave their homeland for a better life that would be the way most people today would think of it, not back then. These people, the immigrants who left uh, their homeland in, in Great Britain, you know, from anywhere in the British Isles, were criticized by many of their fellow British citizens back home as being cowards and being traitors and uh, abandoning their, their homeland, uh, turning their back on their fellow British citizens, all kinds of ridiculously uh, wrong-headed criticism. So last fact now about the meaning. Uh, what quality do you think this painter was trying to convey that these people had that was not the opposite, in other words, of their critics? Anybody? Well, some of you know from your own personal experiences, having read your many bios, what quality, I'll rephrase the question, what quality does it take to leave everything, one of the many, several, but maybe the most important quality that it would take anyone to leave? whether you're an individual, a family, a couple, whatever, uh, leave your entire homeland and move to a new Culture. Courage. Courage. Thank you. Excellent. Courage. That is the point that this painting is trying to convey, which is that contrary to all the criticism that they these kinds of immigrants were getting from people back in England, not everybody thought that, 
but the some in the press some ministers in church you know some political leaders were criticizing those who left this painter um you know brown his name was ford maddox brown is one of the most popular and successful of all english realism he was saying no the opposite is true we should admire and respect the courage that these people had to start over again to start a new life so probably never see the people they grew up with ever again yeah that's his message you know it's somewhat ahead of its time you might say it's certainly in context of the, of the homeland criticism that they got from uh, people that stayed in England and many of them, not all of them. Okay, so that's the social ill he's addressing. And it is super realistic. You can see that when they say transcripts from nature, that's just a fancy way of saying sharp, realistic style. Everything in this painting is super sharp. So let's do the formal analysis. Um, this set of similar textures, superb, isn't it? So she's got a shawl. Uh, both their hats, their faces, the, you know, the hair, the skin, uh, his coat, and then even the rope right around the deck of the boat and the other passengers behind them. The, super sharp. You could even say if you want in your notes, if, and if it's on the, and it could be on the essay part of the final. Photorealism is, is what some people call this. There were photos by this time. Oh, yeah, photography was about uh, almost 20 years old when this painting was made. So there were photos of actually some of these kinds of scenes of, of uh, immigrants on the deck of a boat. Most of them slept outside. And I've done that once or twice. And it's not comfortable even in warm months overnight. Uh, but for weeks, you would be at sea for weeks, of course, on uh, on one of these voyages. If you didn't have money for your own cabin, which most of them didn't, you slept wherever you could find a spot. Anyway, so it's, so it's a sharp, realistic cement texture on all the uh, objects, the clothing, the hair, the skin, uh, the boat. And then the same with the modeling, super sharp, strong modeling. Thin outline, there's no bold outlines here, thin outline on all the objects. It's totally balanced. I mean, look, the two of them balance each other out very nicely, don't they? Right across the middle. Now, some people think her umbrella weights it toward, but I don't think that's accurate because look at these uh, other passengers behind them. They, 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 it balances out both left to right and top to bottom if you drew the line across the middle. And then we have um, the rhythm, of course, of the arms, hands, faces, uh, and, and of course, some of the clothing and parts of the boat, the railing here, right? Uh, and then we have simulated, um, sorry, I meant not simulated texture. We have atmospheric, there we go. At, this has atmospheric perspective in the distance, right? The slightly blue hazy look as you get further away uh, in, in the sky and on the water. And it definitely has scientific perspective. All, all of the uh, scenes painted, you know, if they were not indoors by, a, uh, any of the English realism painters, all of them would have used scientific perspective. And if it was an outdoor scene, atmospheric perspective. Overlapping, of course, foreshortening and diminishing size are all used here. The largest mass, I, it's hard to say. I think they're about equal, but maybe the, the wife and mother is uh, a little larger because you see more of her clothing here, uh, her, her dress, her skirt, a little more of her. So she'd be the largest mass, then him, then her umbrella. Um, and then we have, um, let's see, colors warm mostly, although we could make out that this is gray. It has a kind of tannish, you know, this wool looking shawl. So you could say that's cool. Sort of the background is the water and the, and the uh, sky and the cliffs. But most of the, the people on the boat, the dominant uh, part of the painting are earth tones, warm reds and browns and yellows. Um, and it is mostly stable on them. And you could say the umbrella is dynamic, but even that, it's got straight lines at each angle. So really, I would say only the, the deck of the boat or the, the railing on the deck. And maybe, you know, of course, her hat and, and his her shawl, I guess it is. I'm not shawl. I mean, bonnet. I meant bonnet. Yeah. Or head. You could just say headdress. The, both of those are obviously curved at the top. But those are details. It's mostly stable. There's, they're determined and feeling, you know, anxious, but, but have the courage to go through with something like this. So they're deliberately chosen as stable images by the artist. <clears throat> Although some of the people in the background there's, but even there, you know, there's a mixture of stable and dynamic, but it's mostly stable. Okay, uh, I think we covered everything. All right, let's move on to the next.
by snow. And this one is really interesting. And uh, I'm going to see if people can guess what's going on here. This is still English realism now, the second uh, English realist slides. And then we'll get started with impressionism. And that's the majority of the slides I've asked folk of him for the next uh, two lectures. But this is still English realism. It's uh, the second must know on your list for week 12. Hunt, the artist's last name, Hunt. And the title, I think everyone can, well, I'll spell the third word, The Awakening Conscience. The Awakening Conscience. And that's this the uh, meaning of conscious, you know, right? The sense of right and wrong, of course. It's spelled C O N S C I E N C E, 1853. So, what do we have here? Well, let's see if we can tell by the clues in the painting what social issue or ill is this artist portraying? Well, let's see. How is he dressed? Well, like appropriate conduct? Yeah, I think, say it again. I think you, you got, <laughs> I think you might've hit the nail on the head. I usually work up to, what, what do you think might be going on here? I think that it's uh, like inappropriate uh, conduct of him. Yes, 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 you're right. And that's for a couple of reasons, but uh, absolutely, yes. So something obviously inappropriate that has to do with the different positions, social positions of these two people. We could tell by the way he's dressed that he ain't poor. I mean, he's got fancy cufflinks and mutton chops. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's the word they use. So those weird looking sideburns. Uh, and his, his your coat is fancy. And look at her. She's dressed, yes, like a maid or a nanny. In other words, she's working class poor. In other words, <clears throat> from, you know, who knows what part of the slums of London, probably. And yes, there still are some in London, and there were a lot back then in the 1800s. Slums were more dominant. So this is, oh, did I give you the year? Yeah, I did, 1853. <clears throat> so this is like early Victorian times. So what do you think is, is uh, happening with her? That's the important point. She's the focus of the painting. Look at her face and take the title you know, think about that, the phrase, the awakening conscience. Plus, in case it's not obvious, this is a mirror. She's looking out of a window, which of course is in front of her and reflected in the mirror into the bright sunlight. So can, yeah, I think you can get the symbolism here. Anybody want to summarize what, what do you think she's thinking at this moment in time? Well, look at the body language of his hand and her hands. It's, th these clues are really, really pretty strong. So you got it right the first I'm sorry I didn't catch everyone's name when you speak up. Uh, who was that that just mentioned? Yes, inappropriate behavior, but there's something more going on with her. Who is it that said that? I'm sorry. Oh, it's me, Jessica. Jessica, thank you, Jessica. You're absolutely right on, on, on the nose with correct summary. The situation is he's clearly wealthy and powerful. In fact, if it isn't obvious, you should write this. This is his apartment. He doesn't live there. He is rich enough to afford a tryst pad, as some people would have called in the 60s and 70s. I don't know if that word phrase is still used. You know, he's rich enough to have, you know, more than one place, of course. And one of them is where he bring, has been bringing her. So what do you think, if you just want to cut to the chase, the, the overall message is about her and what's going on in her mind based on the title and the situation we just described. What do you think she's thinking right now? Well, maybe that the, the sky isn't worth it and she shouldn't like yeah, she yeah. doesn't even put up with this <laughs> yeah yeah you could say it. that's as good a way to say it as any yes and if you wrote that on a, on the exam it, it would get full credit as part of the meaning yes in other words this is wrong i don't need to keep, stay in this situation i'm leaving and it's almost like you can hear him say oh what's the matter sit down why are you going to it or some kind of sexist phrase like that obviously this guy's clueless but she isn't anymore she might have been for a while or suppressed her own understanding of the wrong moral, immoral, whatever you want to call it, uh, situation she was in. Uh, because it, it's not his wife, if that's not obvious. <laughs> if someone this rich dressed his own wife that way, that, that marriage wouldn't last very long. So he's taking advantage of her, obviously. And she's finally realizing it's called an epiphany. You could write it that way. But awakening conscience is as good a phrase as any. She's about to leave and he's not going to be able to talk her out of it. I love this detail. The cat, that probably is his <laughs> pet. And the cat looks like he doesn't like this guy either. 
<laughs> you know, and of course he gave her a few presents. He won't even give her a decent dress. That's the part that just, you know, what a piece of work. Anyway, so, but he did give her some nice gloves, right? You know, how much did that cost? Probably a month of her salary, but then, you know, I assume he thought that could buy her, you know, quiet or acquiescent behavior. And you can see this is a rich, fancy, I mean, look at the piano and the gilded clock and everything around. And we already mentioned his clothing is his outfit. He's rich and powerful. She's poor and uh, I won't say powerless, but now she is going to exercise her own power of choice and say, bye <laughs> and and try to find a better life it's a very powerful image and it addresses the social ill of wealthy men especially in uh, you know london but all over the british isles many not all of course but many of them took advantage of their you know higher position in society of their wealth and power or even control by being an employer right over someone uh, who depended on them for livelihood. So she's going to give up an income probably as well as this, this you know, place that's fancy to live in, but at a cost that's just too high for her. So she's uh, had a moment of uh, awakening conscience or an epiphany, if you prefer. Okay, that's the meaning and the social ill it addresses. Formal analysis, really wonderful simulated texture here. That's why I like uh, the, uh, the way he, he decorated. Now this, I can't figure out what that is. It looks like something from one of those uh, paranormal activity movies. I just watched a couple right before Halloween. My daughter wanted to see a couple of those. Ah, they get a little repetitious. But anyway, I don't think that's a ghost writing on the wall. It's just some weird pattern. It's not wallpaper? Thing. Yeah, oh. I think it is wallpaper. I'm being silly. Gotcha. But it's odd <laughs> for Victorian era wallpaper, but the rug is classically, I mean, that's a very expensive rug, probably imported from Persia or somewhere. And all the furniture, all of that is super sharp and their face and hands and clothing and, and hair, of course, is very sharp and realistic. All English realism painting by definition had that as well as strong realistic modeling on all the objects, the you know people and the um, items around them. And this has atmospheric perspective. Look carefully. See that across the street is a blue hazy look. It goes far enough that the view from the mirror, I mean. Uh, so it's got all the, in a definitely scientific perspective. So atmospheric and scientific perspective, of course, overlapping, foreshortening, you know, especially on the piano and the rug uh, and diminishing size of the objects. And then there's thin outline. Again, that's a given with English realism almost always. Um, the colors. Now she's got a cool uh, color dress, uh, you know, poor, <laughs> you know, working class outfit she has. Nonetheless, it, it's a symbolic, uh, important detail that he dressed her, the painter did. This, I'm, I'm sure it's an imaginary scene, but he probably witnessed this among some of his fellow painters would have done this too. You know, they were, they were a scandalous group, something like this. And they often said, well, we just believe in sharing each other's love. So some of them had consensual relationships with each other's uh, husbands and wives. I mean, it was a pretty uh, scandalous movement. <laughs> the English realism movement lasted like two generations. Anyway, so she's in a cool color attire because she's have a cool, calm, uh, logical now, you know, reaction to this, you know, situation that she knows she needs to leave. Now, it's true, his, his, uh, well, he's being kind of coolly manipulative, isn't he? But of course, as is always the case with this uh, human skin tones, uh, their faces and hands and hair, uh, all those are warm colors as is most of the furniture and the, uh, the whole room, the mirror and of course the piano on the road. Uh, then there's the, I already mentioned the rhythm, didn't I? You have the objects, the, p the piano top and the uh, some of the furniture, the patterns and the wallpaper and the rug and arms, hands, legs. The largest mass, you could say it's the room, but that really is so divided. I'd say it's her. And then the piano maybe, and then him. Okay, and it's balanced very carefully with him here and this mirror and the piano on this side. That's roughly an equal area. And she's right in the middle and standing upright. So it's mostly stable, more so than, because his arms out at almost a right angle, piano, the walls, the mirrors. Those are stable, so that's only some dynamic details on their heads, really, and uh, parts of the furniture. Uh, let's see, colors I already mentioned. Yeah, let me miss anything. Modeling, texture, balance, rhythm. I think we covered it. Okay, now we're gonna. You can um, just just listen for the next two or three slides before we get to the first must know of impressionism, and then you'll get that definition. Both of those definitions could appear. That is the one I just gave you for English realism. 
and or the one on Impressionism in the true false section of the final. The final has the same number of slides and points as the midterm. And remember, it's not cumulative. It's everything after the midterm. Okay. Now, this is still Angus realism. You don't have to write this. The next must know is about the three or four slides from this one, but I think it's interesting. This painting has to do with communism or Marxism or socialism or any, however you want to phrase, the so-called, whatever you want to call it, black sheep here. You know, these two actually, particularly this one, has led astray these other sheep. And some historians believe this is called strayed sheep. That's the title of this. And it's by the same painter, Hunt. Now he may have been socially conscious about the abuse of power and wealth uh, by wealthy men, uh, you know, taking advantage of poor women. He definitely was, uh, you know, well, somewhat ahead of his time that way. But politically, he had a different, more conservative perspective. He is this painting is actually saying that the uh, you know two brown sheep here are symbolic of radical political leaders like Karl Marx. If you didn't know this, he lived in England most of, in fact, almost this whole second half of his life. And he was trying to form, you know, of course, a labor movement and the communist party movement in, in England. So he's saying with this painting, it's, it's Hunt, the same guy, but it's, much, it's about 1860. That's dangerous. Don't, these sheep, supposedly representing the masses, you know, of the population, the working class, are going to be led to you know danger and off of a cliff if they follow these you know uh, radical leaders like Marx and other radical uh, agitators they were called right so here you see one sheep's already or two of them look like they're one's dead and the other's dying of what uh, hunger thirst they've been led astray right so strayed with an ed sheep is the title it's a very interesting painting. Uh, and at this point in time, there was, you know, just the beginnings of labor movements. Well, they were around before, but they weren't very powerful yet by 1860. Within 30 years, they became quite powerful. So, of course, this guy, clearly, almost all the English realism painting, painters, I'm sorry, were wealthy from the upper classes. And that's how they had the time and leisure to study painting and decide to become a painter. And if they were very, very good at it, make a living at it, but usually they didn't depend on their income from painting because they were wealthy. So they would have a vested interest in not seeing more radical or even just, uh, you know, uh, groups like unions defending the rights of workers against some of the upper classes. Uh, that's what this painting is about. Okay. There's another version of it or another. I think this is a more accurate one, the first one, but it's not a must know. All right, but this one also not a must know. Well, maybe, did I include it? I, let me see, sometimes I do. Yeah, I'm giving you a break on this. Okay, but I think it's really a powerful painting. And this one has uniquely personal level of meaning, not for the painter himself, but for people he knew who had lost family members. Okay, it's called Ophelia. Now, some of you know, right? Hamlet, yeah, from Hamlet. It's not a must know, or you can just, Ophelia, you know, if you want to write the name, because it could be interesting for either extra credit or maybe if you haven't chosen a topic for your paper, you could still think about writing this one. There's a lot of research on this, a famous painting. It's an English realism painting, Ophelia, right? It was the name of the main female character, no, one of the main female characters in Shakespeare's play Hamlet. Ophelia, right? If you want to know, it's O-P-H-E-L-I-A, but you don't have to write it because it's not on the syllabus. But I would like to ask, does anybody know what happened to her in the play Hamlet? I'm not sure what did he she died. Yeah, she <laughs> died. She committed suicide. She drowned herself mm -hmm. when he rejected her when she made uh, you know a clear romantic advance. It was like um um I don't know. The way that I say it was like a blackmailing or something, but <laughs> Well, it wasn't quite that. No, it was more <clears throat> a case of um, an over. You know, well, here's what the point of the painting is. Yeah, I know we're, we need to, you know, keep moving she, here. But she couldn't handle the. She couldn't handle the rejection. Is the Direct. point? Uh -huh. He was cruel in how he rejected her. You don't have to know any of this, but but again, it could be a topic for extra credit. Um, there's plenty of film versions of Hamlet, and that I'll give you credit ten points for writing a summary of what you learned. Uh, I don't know if there's a documentary. Sure, there are. I know there are documentaries on English realism, and one, at least one of them, 
um, in one of those documentaries. One of the paintings in any decent documentary on English realism movement you could find and get extra credit for summarizing what you learned is this. This painting is one of the most famous English realism paintings of all time. Why? Because there was a wave of suicides like what Ophelia did in the play Hamlet in the mid early to mid 1800s, meaning you know 19th century, uh, because of the romanticizing of suicide for love when you had rejection and unrequited love like she had. By the way, the line it's famous from Hamlet that he said to her that caused her to want to kill herself supposedly in Shakespeare's play was get thee to a nunnery, which was a way of saying, not only will I not marry you, but you shouldn't marry anyone. Go you know, spend the rest of your life holed up in a monastery, right? or nunnery, sorry, uh, that was the ultimate kind of rejection. And she, she lost her mind, dressed in a heavy dress full of flowers that weighed, you know, pounds and pounds of flowers, garlands of flowers around her, so she would sink and then threw herself backwards into a the local river and drowned. That's the scene from the play in Hamlet. So he's depicting that scene and he's saying the social ill that the painting is addressing is this wave of suicides. It wasn't only young women, it was quite often young men. And if you ever have a breakup, don't read this book right afterwards if, if you have this experience. I did in uh, UC Berkeley dormitories. I was one of the only ones that didn't get to go home for Thanksgiving one year, I forget it was my sophomore year. And I had just broken up with my then girlfriend and I read The Sufferings of Young Werther by Goethe. Oh God, that is depressing. It's a brilliant piece of writing. Goethe was of course, one of the most famous writers of that century, translated into English, of course, I didn't read it in German. He was German. But this affected all of Europe. There were thousands of young men and women who would commit suicide after reading a play, it could have, or even seeing one like Hamlet performed if they had an unrequited, rejected love lover, you know, uh, they, they, they often committed suicide. And so a whole bunch of, of, of uh, we'd say influencers today, you know, social commentators were, were uh, what's the word, uh, lecturing about this, giving, you know, sermons in church, uh, essays in newspapers and magazines to young people, don't kill yourself, it's not worth it, wait a while, you'll feel better, and yet thousands did, so this painter decided, he had friends whose uh, sons or daughters had, had committed suicide over this, and uh, so he decided you know, I think a painting that gives an indication of how this is not something, you know, that just a little bit of a, you know, temporary lark or, or impulsive, it, it's fatal, it's your final act, if you do this, you kill yourself, you have no choice, uh, to no chance, I mean, no chance to recover, whereas if you wait a while, hopefully, and, you know, give yourself some time, time heals all wounds or wounds all heals however you want to say that uh, you, you, usually you'll get past it and you, it's not worth taking your life for it it's a pretty powerful message so this painting was reproduced and sent all over the british isles and all over north america too i think canada and the us at least uh to you know places like college universities or even you know private academies which means high private high schools where there were some of these suicides happening and churches and, and places like that and reproduced in magazines and newspapers, of course, in black and white and have color printing then. So um, this, this painting was very influential and I'd say in a positive way. Okay, now there's there actually that's a better view of how it looks. Yeah, she was singing to herself as she slowly sunk under the waves and didn't even remotely try to, you know, change her mind. She literally had lost her mind. Okay, now this is still not the first next must know, but it's my own slides of the best museum of impressionism in the world, the mother load of impressionist paintings and post impressionist both is the Musée d'Orsay, O-R-S-A-Y in Paris. And what you see here is that building, which was an old railroad station built for the 1900 Paris World's Fair. By the way, Paris had more World's Fairs than any other city. So like eight of them or something. But one of the biggest was the one they created the whole subway, the French called the Metro system. If you've been to Paris, you, have you seen any movies that there were no people who lived there or traveled? You know what I'm talking about. It's one of the best subway systems in the world. And it was created to bring people to this uh, World's Fair. And this was a train station for people coming from outside Paris. But it's now a museum of art converted into the museum, the main museum in, in all of France, the biggest one, for Impressionist and Post-Impressionist paintings. Ah, but look what's on the, the roof. This is also my own slide, but don't do this. <laughs> 
if you ever go to that museum, don't go up the stairs and, and step over a chain and a sign, a metal sign painted. I remember, I'll never forget it in, in French, but I understood no French. I had friends there. I've been to Paris many times. I didn't speak the language, but I could understand. Passage interdite. You can guess what that means. Forbidden, don't go up these stairs. There was a good reason for it, but I ignored it because I knew I could get a view of the Louvre. See, they're across the river from each other. That's the Louvre, the largest museum of art in the world. There's a footbridge where you can walk between the two across the river. And then here's the biggest museum in person. It's a fantastically rich district. The, some in American cities, we call this the art district, but it's just the heart of Paris, right? It's such a fantastic area. So I wanted to get this slide. And then when I took this one, I said, you know what, if I walk a little closer to this railing, I'll get an even better view with my telephoto of just the Louvre on the river bank. But as I took a step forward, I heard a cracking sound. I looked down and I was standing on a glass skylight. If I'd walked two or three more steps, I would have fallen five floors straight down to the bottom floor. That's why that sign was there. So don't, don't go up on the roof of a Mosaic de Orsay if you ever get there. Not, not worth the risk. We covered this, didn't we? I think we did. But I'm going to recap because it could still be on the final. I think we did. Right. Let me just double check. It's been what, twelve weeks? Yeah, we did earlier on. Yeah, yeah. Luncheon on the grass. Well, I'll recap because not everybody would remember it. Um, and if I kept it on this one, well, if it's not on the syllabus, maybe I did decide because I've I've gone back and forth about whether or not I should include it. Um, no, it's not on the syllabus. So I'll just recap. You don't have to take notes on this. You've already covered it. Mane, who is the first Impressionist painter, that's debatable. Let's just say he was called the father of Impressionism by his fellow Impressionists. He didn't come up with that title. He was very self-effacing and modest, but one of the most brilliant painters probably ever, but certainly of the 19th century. He was called the father of Impressionism. And so I'll go ahead and give you the title of the next must know, which is right after this, The Pfeiffer, just two words, F-I-F-E-R, Manet, M-A-N-E-T. Don't confuse them with Monet. They were both Impressionists. They painted at the same time. And they were the two first two Impressionists. That's why there's a debate. I've seen it in you know documentaries and in textbooks and online articles about who gets credit to be the first Impressionist. It's a meaningless debate. I used to say it's Manet. But let's just say if his own fellow painters, including Monet, called this guy Manet, the father of Impressionism, they had to have a reason. He experimented with Impressionism before the others, let's put it that way, before any of the other painters that are uh, equally famous. In fact, for Americans, he's not, it's surprising, he's hardly known by most Americans unless you'd study art history like we are now. So what's happening here is a scene uh, in a park. We, we, we can, I'll recap briefly because I want to get to the, the next must know, in which he is in this scene. Most historians believe that's him there because it looks as close as, as we know to photographs. There are photographs of money. And then this would be another Impressionist. Most people think it's Pissarro. It doesn't matter who because you, there aren't going to be tests on this. Just say a fellow Impressionist who hadn't yet developed Impressionism because everyone was still doing realism. The French also, like the English, were still mostly focused on super sharp realism in their, in their paintings. And, and they hadn't yet broken away from it. Well, only the uh, romantic painters were starting to. We covered that last week. And then this woman here we covered before is not what you might assume. She's actually a friend of both artists. And she, some just say some historians believe there's evidence uh, for the fact that she chose to be in the painting and even suggested being painted nude so it would get attention because she believed in these new young artists who were a big breaking all the rules. They were moving away from realism. So the upper third, roughly from the beginning of the pond all the way to the horizon is, is proto-impressionist. There's no other word for it or a pre precursor, you could say, or forerunner of impressionism. Even her body, if you look closely, except for her arm really and her head, but her clothing, right? Uh, and her, her back, her upper arm and back, in all the area around her, the pond, the trees, the bushes, it's all painted. Some people just say fuzzy. Oh, what do you think fuzzy is impressionist? No, we're going to give you the definition of impressionism and the next must know. So here, the whole upper half is not at all realistic, except for one or two little details. 
the upper third, let's say. And it's shocking. It was more shocking than the nudity of the woman in the foreground to critics. They hated this because they thought the upper part looked like he didn't finish the painting or he was deliberately insulting his audience by giving them something you know less than realistic. So why was he called the father of Impressionism? Here we go, I already gave you the title of this next must know. Very important slide, high possibility, if not probability of being on the final. Okay, so here's what I like to say about this is part of the meaning, you can write it just like I'm giving it to you or some paraphrase of this concept. I like to say that this little boy started a revolution without even realizing it, by which I mean, we don't know who this model was. It doesn't matter. That's not the important part of the meaning of this, but it is considered, you can just say one of, and by many historians, the first Impressionist painting. So it's either the first fully Impressionist painting or one of the first fully Impressionist painting. So now here's that definition of Impressionism. Okay. And it's long enough that I'll say it slowly and repeat it. It's, it's two lines like the last one. Here we go. Impressionism was a movement of French painting. Uh, and I used to give years, but now I just say after 1865. That's a safe way to say, or you could say from 1866 on if you prefer. It, it never died out, but it didn't be, exist before that. So just say it's, I'll say it again. The first part of the definition of Impressionism is it was a movement of French painting after 1865 in which artists uh, portrayed their own intuitive impressions of how light affects a scene. I'll say it again. In which artists portrayed their own intuitive uh, impressions of how light affects a scene, period. First sentence. Second sentence is, they did this with a technique called, and these are quotes from there, they had a manifesto, they were an organized group, as you know, if you know anything about persons, they exhibited with each other every year for 20 years. So here we go. So they did this with a technique called, quote, definitely quotes around it, the color patch revolution, unquote. So again, they did this with a technique called, quote, the color patch revolution, unquote. So what does that mean? Well, that means that color and the way light affects how we see color is the main uh, new technique of the Impressionist movement. In other words, they didn't convey strict reality. They were totally different, of course, than the English realist or other European realists. It wasn't only the English people that did that. Uh, of course, yeah, obviously the Renaissance starts the super realist style painting in the 1400s. We've covered that in Italy. So they were breaking Impressionist painters. We're breaking the rules of Renaissance realism. That's another way to say it. They, they were the first major, you could say major or famous movement to break several or many, you could say, of the rules of Renaissance realism. Well, that requires us to overlap. You see, it's part of the meaning now when you talk about the, the uh, formal elements, that's the only way you can tell if something's impressive. Not just any fuzzy painting is impressive. It's more com uh, complicated than that. So let's look at what makes this an impressionist painting, or if not the first, one of the first. There are four of the rules of Renaissance realism that Manet did not use or used to minim minimally, either not at all or minimally. I'll say that fast, but minimally in this painting. First of all, space. We don't know where he is. It's all part of the meaning. So you know, follow along and you know, write this however you will remember it best. But it's really important to mention the four things that Renaissance realist paintings would have all had that this painting has little or none of, starting with space, are really what define it as a, one of the first impressions paintings. We don't know where he is. Is he indoors? Is he outdoors? Is it daytime? Is it nighttime? Is he on the sidewalk? Is he inside? Is he in a, a crowd? Is he by himself? We don't know and the painter doesn't care. He doesn't try to convey any uh, of the realistic techniques for space. 
I mean, there's overlapping. That's it. Overlapping, of course, that, that goes back to prehistoric times. So that's nothing, you know, very, very realistic. There is no sense of space or depth here as to where the placement of this figure in real space is just not there. It's missing. Okay, that was radical enough. This painting was horribly criticized by, by almost all the mainstream um, art critics and gallery owners and museum curators. It, it was rejected. It wasn't allowed to be displayed anywhere except in the Impressionist's own galleries. They actually had a few galleries that some of them owned. But this painting was roundly criticized for these very reasons. Okay, what's the second thing that this uh, doesn't convey? There are no sharp or realistic simulated textures. The closest you can come, it's called implied texture, is on his hands. But even there, if you get, it's, actually, I have a closer view. Let, let's get up to that. Yeah. There we go. These are my own slides, by the way. This is at the Mosaic Orsay. But even there, look carefully. It's it's really different colors side by side. This isn't photorealism. This isn't Renaissance or later English realism. It's it's not. It's implied textures. Yes, they're implied here, but they're almost all due to patches of color. Look at his uh, the top of his jacket. The, the patches side by side, so dark you can't even distinguish really his arm from the jacket behind it. Uh, and then uh, look at the way the buttons, you know, almost may blend into the sleeve here. And then of course his hat, that's really an obvious example. Patches of color side by side is the technique that you see here. So there is no realistic semantic texture, only implied textures. That's the second rule of Renaissance realism that is not followed or adhered to in this painting and by other impressionists. Okay, the third thing is minimal, you can't say none, but minimal modeling. Normally you'd see deep shadows around his face, assuming it's probably in daylight, or if not, at least some kind of lighting would have to you know, be present or we couldn't see him at all. We don't see any aspect of that on his face, except minimally, I mean, really stretching it around the edges of his, his cheeks, but even there, it is going to surprise you. There's the fourth thing that's missing. Well, let's go back down here. Here, you see a hint of modeling at the top of the sash. Otherwise, it's patches of white, just as his jacket. Absolutely, his jacket would have shadows on it. Of course, it would. It, right, his arm, it's all dark, dark blue, almost black, as is the hat. Again, so there is little or no modeling. You could say minimal modeling, if you prefer. Just mostly on the fingers and maybe his cheeks, and a little bit on the bottom half of his pants, because even the upper half, it's mostly, you know, side by side patches. Of course, that's how he painted this, of uh, kind of dark red. And the same thing with the flute. The flute is patches of different colors of yellow that are somewhat in the gold range. Okay, so little or no, you could say minimal modeling. What's the fourth thing? This is the one that shocked people more than anything else. There is no line used in this painting. None. It's line as outline is abandoned. There is color side by side, but there is no line used in this painting, none. In fact, Manet was so proud of that, that he announced that fact. And when he first exhibited this or tried to, and finally got it in the own, their own gallery, it was the only place people could go to see it. I don't even know who bought it, if anyone. It's at the Mosaic d'Orsay now. And there's a whole curator's catalog about this painting and the other Manets as in M-A-N-E-T in the Mosaic d'Orsay about how he abandoned the use of line as outline. Patches of color side by side is not line as outline. I'm saying outline. Okay, so we probably should specifically say in your notes, your fourth item that you include that is not used as part of Renaissance realism that is abandoned in this painting is uh, a line as outline. We'll just say that line used as outline is not used in this painting at all. And that was the most shocking thing to most of the uh, critics. They couldn't have, they hated this painting. They called it uh, flat. Uh, it looks like a playing card. Uh, why doesn't he tell, show us where this young boy is? Uh, this is an amateur unfinished painting. Again, unfinished, why? Because he didn't show background and depth and space uh, around him. It was not understood, or you could just say it was misunderstood. Obviously, that happens in new artistic work. Now, someone had a, a question, I sound like, or a comment. By all means, I welcome any uh, at any point. Someone wanted to add something of the, your own perspective or, or question or anything? Somebody had? Nope. 
Okay. Because the point is when you look at it closely and you start thinking, you'd say, well, I think I see some texture, but then you look carefully and like his sash, that's just patches of white and a little bit of touch of gray at the very tip of this uh, corner, uh, if you want to call it. Th there's not, you know, realistic, just comparing it, of course, once again to, right, English realism. Look how sharp and realistic every cement texture is. It's totally different. This is radical departure from that. Okay, so that's enough on the meaning. We'll just say that when this painting, well, you already said it, you should have, if you didn't add that last fact to your meaning section of your notes, that this uh, painting was roundly or greatly, you can say, in fact, uh, vehemently is a good word, vehemently criticized in the mainstream art criticism press and by gallery and museum owners all over France. He couldn't display it anywhere except in their own exhibit. They, had, they rented halls, they, I don't think they own them, the Impressionists. So his fellow Impressionists understood how radical and advanced and, and new this was and, and why he'd done it. But the mainstream art world didn't get it. 20 years later, he was already dead by then, his painting started to sell at very high prices. He could he sold some. He wasn't as poor as Van Gogh was during his lifetime, but he barely made a living some years. Same thing with Monet too, if you can believe that. And then later he became one of the wealthiest painters in, in the world because he lived a long life. Uh, Monet died in his early 40s or mid 40s. Even back then that was young. Okay, formal analysis. I've already covered four of the techniques, so let's just do the other five. Is it balanced? Yeah, I'd say so. This This foot sticks out here and then you've got his cap sticking out or his arm here it's balanced he's he's roughly across the middle um and top to bottom too if you count the empty space above and below his body and then uh colors are warm on his pants and uh um it's so you know minimal but there's some warm hues on his skin on his hands and his face but it's uh almost neutral, close to black. It's really a dark, dark blue on his jacket there and part of his hat. Uh, so technically it's a, a dark blue would be of course a cool color and his sash is cool, but it's warm on the flute, on his buttons and his pants, neutral on his shoes and, and black and white on his shoes. Um, the rhythm is obvious, that is clearly still here. And that's his, you know, his hands and his buttons and his two legs and feet. Uh, and then we have, uh, the, there's really, you could say three masses if you want him, then the flute case, and then the flute. Um, let's see, am I forgetting anything? We've covered most of the other elements, balance, rhythm. Oh, stable or dynamic? I would consider mostly stable. He's standing upright, but one of his legs is, is slightly diagonal. But the flute is almost at a right angle to his, uh, you know, body and I would say it's more stable than dynamic but there's some curve to the upper part of his uh, his shoulders and of course his hat so you could just say it's a mixture okay now you don't have to take slides on this but if it's not clear about what impressionism is by the end of this slide it should be you don't have to write it's not on syllabus it's by Monet again the same guy and it's called Grand Canal Venice it's just fabulous to stand in front. It's, it's almost life-size, it's huge. Well, let's just say half life-size. The boat isn't life-size, but it's like a scene you might be witnessing if you go to Venice. I don't know if any of you have been to Venice, but if you ever go there, you never forget that place, that experience. It's unique as everyone knows. I mean, uh, there are other cities with canals, of course, all over the world, but uh, believe me, if you've been to Venice, California, and you go to the real place, this no, or even the, the club, in uh, Vegas called, isn't it called Venito? <laughs> nice place, but no comparison. So here's what this painting conveys. The technique of impressionism, as you would experience the way a person, you don't have to write any of this, just listen. Uh, the way a person might experience seeing the effect of light in, you know, afternoon light, it's clearly an afternoon scene where, for instance, let's just give you a scenario. Let's say you're in Venice, you know, and it gets very hot there most of the time, tourists traveling in the summer, of course, in the hot time of the year. So you might want to just, you know, kick back and, and um, you know, maybe lie back. There's no benches there. So you might just lie on the, you probably get kicked by a gendarme, but maybe if you can, you sleep, maybe take a nap because you had your queso and your chiante, right? And you're tired and, and uh, whatever, a little buzz. So you just close your eyes and you completely you know, go to sleep for, and then you wake up in the late afternoon. 
And as you look past your own feet into the distance, the near distance, first, just a few feet maybe away from where you're lying, because there's no wide boulevards, there's no cars there, right? There's no streets. So just sidewalks and bridges and canals. So let's say you look just a few feet away from where you're lying, and you see the water closest to you in that part of the canal. And what do you notice about it? the light dappling off the surface of the water. It's just really well done here. That isn't super realistic. And yet in some ways it's more realistic because it invokes the subconscious reaction. That's what the impressive we're trying to do of how our brain perceives light and colors in different types of light at different times of day. Okay, that's why most impressive paintings are in the daytime, they almost all are. Okay, then the next thing you might notice would be how the light is reflecting off, whoops, I went too far, off of the gondola poles here, their reflection and the gondola itself as it gets closer to us. So you see how the darker, heavier uh, colors and shapes are reflected and the light creates that impression. Then you'd see the boat. It's the most solid thing in your field of vision, the darkest thing. And remember black absorbs colors, right? The color black is the presence of all colors. I think we covered that the first two, two weeks of class, right? So the boat, these are all black, painted black. All the canal boats are in Venice. So that would be an object that would really stand out with all, once your eyes start beginning to focus on things in the middle ground. And then you might look across the canal, you know, which this is probably the Grand Canal, one of the wider ones. So it would take, you know, it's in the distance, you'd see the uh, windows, the shadows from windows and doors and the buildings across canal and then the last thing your eyes might pick up is the gondolier because his black vest and white shirt and black hat or dark gray blends into the shadows of the buildings behind him it's a brilliant exercise in what the whole concept of impressionism is all about so i like to show this for that reason okay let's go on to the next must know and this is renoir i think most of you have seen this painting if you've seen any impressionism Renoir, okay, R-E-N-O-I-R, -E and it's Ball at the Moula de la Galette, and I'll have to spell part of it for you. Ball, of course, you know, a dance. At the Moula, that now means windmill, but it, back then it almost meant nightclub. Because it, it, it had double meaning. M-O-U-L-I-N, Moula or Moulin, if you're from Indiana. De la, I'm sure you know those two words, right? De La and then Galette is G A L E T T E. That's the name of the nightclub where these people are. But this is a daytime scene, like most impressions paintings. The date of this is 1876. So Renoir's paintings, here are the facts about the meaning, showed the new Parisian, or just you could say French, because he didn't only paint in Paris. Most of his paintings were in and around Paris. You can say the new French middle class enjoying their leisure time. If you even went back at one generation, there wouldn't be very many uh, couples, you know, in large groups like this enjoying a relaxing weekend. This is a Saturday. I think they even said that. I'm not sure stocks did, but from what I've read, this is at the Museo d'Orsay too. So they're enjoying a weekend afternoon. They are middle class, mostly professional couples who a generation ago, their parents couldn't probably afford to didn't have enough time off and had to work too many hours to relax. So it's, again, his themes, most of his paintings were about the new French middle class, which he had been part of. He became quite wealthy before the end of his life. But when he started out, he was middle class. The new French middle class enjoying their leisure time uh, among their friends. There's no more deeper meaning except for the style. He was the most popular and successful of all, this is part of the meaning of the impressionist painters during his lifetime. He's still one of the most popular now, right? But most people they can name one impressionist now would probably, if they never studied art history, would think of Monet, right? Okay, so just say during his lifetime, he became the most popular and uh, wealthiest of, or just say successful, because it's hard to measure the wealth that far back. So just say most popular and successful of all the French 
Impressionist. Well, just Impressionist, period, because it was a French movement. These are friends of his. In fact, some people say these are portraits of the group he hung out with the most. Possibly one of these two women are his fiance. He included her in a lot of paintings. So say that's a possible one of these two women on the end of the table. But the people at the group closest to us at the table in the lower right corner are definitely people he knew. They were friends of his. And he often included various members of his circle of friends in his painting. Now, what did he do differently than other Impressionists? He didn't always abandon scientific perspective. In fact, he even in this painting, he has that here. And he has atmospheric perspective. If you go up close, you can see that here. But where is this? Well, it's a nightclub, but it's not at night. So it is a dance floor in indoor outdoor space. That's really the easiest, shortest way to describe the setting of this painting. It was unique in Paris. Now there are other places all over the world like this, but it was one of the first places to have an indoor outdoor uh, entertainment area or dance floor. It was specifically, but not only dances, they would have concerts there and probably various kinds of gaming like gambling and stuff. So it's a, it's a nightclub that was used both day and night and every season of the year because how, look at this, how are these, these uh, huge chandeliers, you know how heavy they must be, how, where are they suspended from? This is outdoors, right? It looks like outdoors, the sunlight shining through the trees and the trees are rising up into the sky. Uh-uh, no, it's very deliberately misleading. He cut off the ceiling. He wanted you to be you know, curious or, or even confused about this setting because unless you'd been there, you wouldn't know this. The ceiling was a giant glass and metal framework that had holes every so many feet for the uh, trees. They, in other words, when they built this dance floor, they left some of the old trees that were already growing there where they were. So that, in other words, it didn't matter winter, summer, you know, hot, cold weather, rain or shine, they could continue entertaining. This nightclub could continue entertaining people day and night, 24 seven. Well, I don't know about how late at night, but they usually stayed open. And it's true in Paris now till like four in the morning of their nightclubs. So just say for, you know, almost the entire daytime or evening hours that this entertainment venue would continue functioning for whatever, in this case, it's a dance, of course, with some live music, uh, musicians, I'm sure, in the background. <clears throat> and it's because of this brilliant technique of an indoor outdoor space, which is very radical and, and advanced for that time. Now it's not uncommon, right? with a glass and metal frame ceiling, which allowed the chandeliers to hang. So at night they could light it up, of course, and the trees to protrude through openings. It, it, I've, I've seen the place, it's still there. It's very uh, interesting architecturally, but uh, socially it was a good place for these people to congregate. Okay, so that's the meaning here. He continued to use that through the formal elements scientific perspective and atmospheric perspective, but obviously he also used the other techniques, overlapping, foreshortening, of course, right, <clears throat> and diminishing size. Then we have the soft diffused, is a good way to say it, modeling and implied semi texture. A truly precious painting has that in common, no matter which version of Impressionism it is, whether it's Renoir, Monet, Manet, <clears throat> they would use soft diffuse modeling. You can see that everywhere on the entire painting, on the trees, on the wall, in the background, uh, on the dance floor, on their faces. Uh, combined with uh, uh, implied textures. There's no realistic semantic textures here. Um, it's mostly stable. The dancing couples are mostly standing upright and these people are sitting upright, but there are some dynamic details. Obviously the hats and the tops of these two women's heads, but it's more stable than dynamic. I mean, look at the back walls and the trees. Yeah. Um, and then we have um, a balance. Some think because there's empty dance floor visible, it's unbalanced toward the right. I wouldn't argue with that. But to me, it's balanced definitely top to bottom because of the you know objects here above the heads of the people, the chandeliers and the treetops. <clears throat> so it's roughly balanced top to bottom and maybe somewhat unbalanced toward the right. There's no line here. Again, a true and precious painting did not use line as outline. Uh, but then you do see mostly cool colors because they're wearing blue colored suits, dresses, but there's warm, of course, colors on the yellow straw hats on the chair here. Uh, I guess you say the tree trunks and, and the sunlight in the trees. But then again, the background has plenty of blue. So it's, it's more cool than, than blue, uh, I mean, than warm. And then we have the um, uh, obvious rhythm of the arms, hands, legs, hats, and so forth. 
um, let's see, are we forgetting the largest mass? Well, it's, it's up to you. I'd say this almost forms a single mass, this group of friends that were, again, probably his inner circle. Uh, if they're one single group and they, you see them as a single mass, clearly they'd be the largest. Then it's a close call. Maybe this couple here, and then maybe uh, this group of people over here or individuals. Okay, we'll do one more and then take uh, call it the day. This is another red war. I've already spelled his name. Right, luncheon of the boating party, luncheon of the boating party, 1881. We'll do this quickly. I already said who Rene, uh, Renoir, sorry, Renoir was, and, and what he did with his impressionism. He didn't abandon scientific perspective in most, but in this one he did. These things don't line up. Look at the tent, the ceiling of the tent, the railing that they're leaning against, these two people. And and even, you know, the right, he and does have- Mark, do you mean to switch the picture? Or are we still doing the same picture? No, this is, here it is. This is, yeah, I did switch it. That, still the same photo. Yeah, I still see the. That's very strange. Why would that? Yeah. Why We're still it, looking at a uh, long Hang on, hang on. No worries. Why would it pause? That's weird. <laughs> okay, so we have a, give me a second. And if I can't fix it in like less than 90 seconds, well, I'm going to have to do, uh, yeah, I might have hit something, but I'm not aware of that. So hang on, I'm going to do this. If I can't do it, let's say under two minutes, because I want to get through Anwar because we've got uh, quite a bit to cover on Wednesday. But thank you for pointing that out. So here we go. Let's see if this will bring it up. If not, then there's something wrong with that image. Um, where are we here? There it is. Okay, this wouldn't take too long. If it's going to pull up at all, let's go straight to that one. And hopefully, then I have to do this <laughs> and bring up, of course, this share screen. Let's hope we can do that. Hmm. Not sure. I think I should hit this one. Can you see it now? Yeah. Good. I don't know what happened. It's just a glitch. I didn't hit anything. Thank you. Okay, we'll do this quickly. This is, again, pretty much the same basic concept. His friends, this is his fiance, though. This time, there's no debating. That's his fiance. He was soon to marry her. Uh, obviously, she's, you know, very much in love with her dog. <laughs> don't write that. But there's no scientific perspective here. It's it's not typical of him. He liked to include scientific perspective often, but not. I can't even say a majority of his paintings. He's one of the few impressions that didn't totally abandon it, in other words. But here he did. There's atmospheric perspective. We'll do the formal analysis here and then wrap it up uh, in the blue hazy look. That's you know the shoreline of the river, the Seine, right? It's not in Paris. They're obviously out in the countryside on an afternoon outing here. And they all took whatever, a couple of boats, maybe one big boat to, to get to this, this riverside cafe and clearly they're enjoying the good life i mean french wine yep there's a reason why it's considered the best in the world by many <laughs> many other countries um as good as we have <clears throat> they have pretty good wine there and it's not expensive in, when you're in france at least it used to be so they're enjoying the nice you know relaxing lunch with typical french food and wine and they're just you know enjoying the good life of course and and there is overlapping obviously and there is foreshortening here definitely that we usually kept using that on the railing and on the shoulders of these people especially these two men leaning over here on the far right here i'd say it's a balanced um uh, roughly balanced now now that i look at it more closely it's unbalanced clearly towards the right there's no question because all the empty space behind these two figures I used to say balance top to bottom. It depends on where you draw the line. If you count the bushes as a mass and, the, and of course the tent roof or top, tent top, <clears throat> I would call it roughly balanced top to bottom. Obviously the full of the rhythm of arms, hands, legs. There is again, no line is outlined here. It comes close, but here there is some similar texture. I would argue on that man's arm, to me, I'd see similar texture, not on the rest of the people behind him or around him. Uh, maybe on this guy's arm, but it, no, not really. So it's just on that one arm and then um, almost on her dress, but not really. Look carefully. It's still a soft and diffuse modeling everywhere, except maybe on his arm. That's the one detail where you say there's realistic similar texture and modeling. There's no debating that. And the rest is a pretty soft, diffused, and of course, uh, 
there's no line is outline. And uh, here for space, you have foreshortening, diminishing size, right? Uh, and atmospheric perspective and overlapping. And the largest mass, I'd say it's the table probably. And then maybe these uh, men here, these two men, because you see their whole upper bodies and po possibly then are uh, close, even off equal. Uh, second largest mass would be his fiance because you can see the top of her whole body. Okay, and it is mostly stable. Look carefully, the, the, the whole tent there underneath here, the railings, uh, most of the people in the background are standing upright. Uh, and even to some degree, well, he's tilted slightly, but this guy's standing upright. I'd say it's more stable, but there's plenty of dynamic details on those uh, people that are leaning over on the railing and uh, some of the, uh, the optics, the glasses and bottles on the table. And then the colors, cool in the background. And on many of their clothes, hey, it's summer, you know, they wear light colored clothes. So of course, most of the clothing of the, of the men at least is cool. Whereas with the women, it's also cool, but cool blue as opposed to uh, white. And then the background, you'd have to say it's mostly cool. But this tent ceiling or, or roof, tent top is warm as is all the skin tones of the human beings. And then the mixture of warm and cool colors on the food and drink on the table. Okay, well, there we go. We went a little over, but I think we needed to because I had to give you those announcements. So now I will stop the share <laughs> intentionally and um, stick around while if any of you have questions, I will answer those now. Anybody about your second paper, do it one week from now at midnight uh, or uh, extra credit? Yeah. yeah, I've got well, two questions. I guess one of them is, is that uh, I've been trying to find another source because you said that you have to have at least, I believe, three sources and one of them has right. to be from like either a book or some kind of archive. Like I'm trying to like, it's I'm struggling to find books on. on oh, certain... okay. I thought uh, for the first paper, I think we covered this, but maybe I don't know if you, you happen to have seen that or, or watched the video yeah. of it. We, we talked about it briefly, but I can answer the question easily. Yeah, obviously, realistically and fairly to all of you in this, you know, still semi- whatever you know, shut down period we're in. The libraries are not open on campus. Some of the city libraries are, but I don't expect you to troop down to a library. So just online, you can find this. Like Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica is a good example where they have almost always published every whatever it is, three years or five years that they update, uh, actual hard copies in print, but you can access them online. So the same with magazine, every magazine and newspaper now does that. So you could say originally print source when you find something from what was once originally a, an article or, you know, whatever, usually it'd be an article, wouldn't it, that you're citing and putting in a bibliography. You just need to say in parentheses, original print source or originally from a print source. And that would oh. be an encyclopedia, magazine, newspaper. Also, you can check, at, uh, I was at the Sonoma Art Museum and they have like a mini, uh, library or something they had tons of books with oh that's a good tip yeah and that's in that and you can use uh, at at sonoma uh the sonoma museum sonoma, the city or Santa yes. Rosa. uh you can use the books so. which oh. city is it in i'm sorry at sonoma at the, in sonoma the city of sonoma so I, that, that, yeah. Uh, yeah i haven't been there since before the pandemic one of my favorite towns in california they have lots of books and you can use it as much as and they would have a you could look them up online for their yeah. hours yeah, and maybe even have a book held, maybe, if you could do that online. Yes. Some libraries will do that. Yeah, the Berkeley City Library is open. All the branches are, as uh, I think are the Santa Rosa and Petaluma uh, City Libraries, too. But you don't have to go to library if that's a problem for you. For whatever reason, that's your business. You can find what was originally a printed source online. I'll give you an example. <laughs> Not that you're going to write about this, but if anyone chose to write about the Miwok culture or one of their you know, uh, houses, which I put into an article I did for in magazine, it's about to come out in hard copy, but it's online. It's been online for a while. So I wrote that as a, you know, piece for a magazine that both has both editions, an online edition and a print edition. That's true for almost every magazine that's still around after the pandemic or even earlier because of the internet uh, and every newspaper for sure has both as do almost all uh, textbook publishers and encyclopedias. But again, yes, that's a good tip. Thank you. You can still find some libraries to actually go to. Um, I do Thank you guys question. so much. Sorry, you're welcome. Go ahead. Is it another question? Um, yeah. yeah. I sent you my ticket as a proof that I went to the museum, but you didn't reply. Oh, I thought I did. I, I'm pretty sure I gave you credit. Let me just double check. 
It's because uh, I, I I went to another uh, nice uh, uh, Sacramento. They have uh, you have you have now thirty points extra credit. I think that's all of them. Maybe I just didn't respond, but I thought I had. I usually try to. So you, I apologize. It's okay. That. I can send it. Yeah, my computer died for five days. I wasn't sure if I'd lose all my files, and then I got a guy come out to my house. Luckily for me, he he's not retired or fully, and he he fixed everything. Okay, I can say So that. I think that's why you have 30 points now, which is the most of anybody, but you could still get 30 more. Now you'd need to do other than museums, though. You know, remember, you can't do all 60 points in any one. So you've got, yeah. you know, either my novels that you could download for 15 points each. It is all in the course policies and grading. Uh, I, think, I think that you didn't get to see my email because I, I also went to a um, historical house. Oh, okay. Which house was it? It's... Lala or Leland mansions mentions. Oh, I didn't see that one. Well, yeah. resend it because okay. that's 10 points right there. Another, so you'd have 40 then, yeah. And you could do that one more time, and then you, you still do something else, you know, for the last 10 points if you want. Okay, so resend that and, and I'll, I will respond. Not today because I have to teach until 9 30 tonight, back to back classes, but tomorrow I would respond. But if you send it today, I, I will look for it. Okay, remember to mark W. Which you've been doing, I think, right? Not to the Outlook. It's easier for me to log it in from uh, AOL. Any other questions about anything relating to your grades, extra credit, your second paper, or, or the slides we just covered? Anybody? These are my unofficial office hours. Okay. Well, I hope you found it interesting. And next, we're going to see some of the more, even more famous Monet. Right, and Degas, people that you've all heard of uh, Impressionist painting. So hopefully we'll have a higher turnout even than what we had today. But it will all be, of course, all of these slides and these lectures, as always, posted by 8 p.m. on Friday on YouTube. Okay. Any Thanks, more? Anybody else? That's it? All right, you guys have, have a good you. We'll see you soon. See you Wednesday, right, at uh, 3. Okay, bye. <laughs>